The meaning of consent has been a heavily charged subject for quite some time. Not that it should be. The meaning of consent is very simple. It is when someone agrees either by action or by verbalisation that they're okay to do an act, whilst unimpaired and being sound of mind. It's not particularly difficult to understand. However, the issue remains. Accusations fly in the modern age of technology and bloody Twitter. The court of public opinion has become a massive stage where both real abuse and fabricated allegations can be spread with merely an eye roll. This leads to the topic of today's video. Truth or consequences? We're going to look at multiple allegations against multiple people, some of which are true, some of which are false. We're going to look at the methods at which both parties can spread information, misinformation and truth. And most importantly, we're going to look at the truth and the consequences of it all. So sit back, grab a coffee and understand that the viewer discretion is definitely advised as we'll be discussing some rather complex and difficult issues. Without further ado, truth or consequences. They absolutely murder the content creators that they're obsessed with. So I've been covering this quiet situation ever since stuff went down about a week, two weeks ago. Hey guys, I want to talk about a lot of the stuff that's been going on online lately, whether it's through YouTube or Twitter or places like that. If you guys enjoyed the video, smash like, subscribe, we're going to beat my wife. It's very easy to let the world see what's on your mind. If I want to let people know that horses aren't real, all I have to do is move my fingers a couple of times on a computer that fits inside my pocket. And bang, the world can see my thoughts and feelings. This sort of technology, whilst slowly growing out of its infancy, can be used with a varying degree of malice. For example, someone could let the world know that they believe pigs are rather adorable. And within an hour, that same person could advocate for the slaughter of a group of people they find unappealing or have a general dislike for. The full character of man can be displayed online with very few real-world actions. The media machine has made this terrifying lazy. If you would like a harmful and potential dangerous example, look at the capital riots in the US. Misinformation and lies spread through the media as well as at the rally for the world to hear. This led to the destruction and violation of the Capitol building in the US, all orchestrated by an orange tit who couldn't convince himself that people didn't want him to be present anymore. If you'd like another example, just look at anything that Jordan B. Peterson has tweeted today. The internet can be used for good and evil. Hell, thanks to the internet, I can post a 1 hour 20 minute video on the LGBTQIA plus community and then play Town of Salem with my friends. It can be both good and evil, and half the time it is good. However, the media machine requires blood, and if you're paying attention, there's always something going on. And it's usually on Twitter. Now, don't get it twisted. This isn't an expose piece on Twitter. I'm not taking on the media. I sure as shit don't want to fight Elon Musk in a car park, as much as that sounds like a productive afternoon. I want to discuss the way in which people use the platform, whether for their own benefit, or for more nefarious purposes. To discuss this, we need to talk about two things. One, cancel culture, and two, allegations. We'll start with the easier of the two, cancel culture. This is the phenomenon which has occurred in the past couple of years, either due to poor public action or previous actions coming to light, people withdraw support, harass and otherwise threaten a person, whether that be a celebrity, a streamer, a YouTuber, or a journalist, whoever. The list goes on and on, on the targets of council culture, and I'm not here to argue about it. I'm here to discuss it. I'm going to refrain from commenting on it personally, and I'll try and keep this as neutral and biased as possible. Whether a person is guilty of the actions is usually a coin flip. It's a 50-50 chance. If there's evidence of the actions, then usually it becomes less even in odds. However, evidence can be forged, cherry-picked, or sometimes just false. Someone could accuse me tomorrow of something absolutely outrageous and disgusting, and with the right forged evidence, they could be believed, and people would take their side once they realise I hit and ran Dolly Parton in 1995. Well, that is untrue, completely fabricated. It could circulate very easily, thanks to Twitter. I could sit here all day and list victims of quote-unquote cancel culture, 
but that would be bloody dull. On top of this, sometimes people have actually committed wrongdoing and they're getting cancelled for all the right reasons. Again, I'm not here to argue that. I'm not here to argue for anyone at all who found themselves targeted by cancel culture, whether true or false. But to consider everyone either innocent or guilty due to this is extremely dangerous. Proponents of council culture argue that it's a necessary tool for holding powerful individuals and institutions accountable for their actions. By publicly calling out people who engage in harmful behaviour, council culture is seen as a way to create social change and promote justice. For example, council culture has been used to hold individuals accountable for sexual harassment, assault, racism and other forms of discrimination. However, Critics of cancel culture argue that it's often used as a means for stifling free speech and promoting a culture of fear and intolerance. Some argue that cancel culture can lead to mob mentality, where individuals are targeted and attacked without being given the opportunity to defend themselves or explain their actions. Others argue that cancel culture promotes a culture of intolerance, where individuals are afraid to express their opinions or engage in debate for fear of being cancelled. One of the main concerns with cancel culture is the potential for individuals to be unfairly targeted and punished for their actions. In some cases, individuals have been cancelled for minor offences, or for actions that have occurred many years ago. Anyone see the Philza situation? He said the R word, and people went a little bit apeshit banana crazy. This has led some people to argue that cancel culture promotes a culture of cancel culture itself, where individuals are targeted simply for having a different opinion, or for expressing themselves in a way that is deemed unacceptable by some. Another concern with cancel culture is the potential to stifle free speech. Um, it promotes a culture of fear and intolerance. Critics argue that cancel culture promotes a culture of political correctness. Ever heard the term PC? That's what that means. Where individuals are afraid to express their opinions or engage in debate for fear of being cancelled. Can lead to culture conformity, where individuals are afraid to express their views or challenge the status quo, for fear of being ostracised or punished. Despite these concerns, some argue that council culture is an important tool for promoting social change and holding individuals and organisations accountable for their actions. For example, council culture has been used to hold politicians accountable for their actions and it promotes greater diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Now, let's discuss allegations. Twitter has been the site of numerous allegations of sexual assault and harassment in recent years. These allegations typically involve individuals who use Twitter as a platform to share their stories of abuse or harassment, often with the goal of holding their abusers accountable and seeking justice. One high-profile example was the hashtag MeToo movement, which began in 2017. It quickly spread across social media platforms, including Twitter. The movement was started by activist Taranya Burke. If I'm saying that wrong, I apologise and it encouraged survivors of sexual assault and harassment to share their stories using the hashtag MeToo. The movement led to the downfall of numerous high-profile individuals, including Hollywood producer Sleaze Ball and rapist Harvey Weinstein, who was convicted of sexual assault and rape. Twitter has also been the site of numerous allegations of sexual assault and harassment within the platform itself. In 2020, a former Twitter employee named Ta Tanya Huang, again, saying that wrong, I'm very sorry, filed a lawsuit alleging that she was sexually assaulted by a co-worker at a company event in 2013. Huang also alleged that Twitter had failed to take appropriate action to address her complaints and she was retaliated against for speaking out about the incident. In the response to these allegations, Twitter implemented a number of measures to address sexual harassment and assault on its platform. These include new policies and reporting mechanisms for users who experience harassment or abuse, as well as training and education for employees on how to prevent and address these issues. However, some critics argued that these measures are not enough and that Twitter needs to do more to address the pervasive problem of sexual harassment and assault on its platform. They argue that Twitter should take a more proactive approach to identify and remove abusers and harassers from the platform rather than relying on users to report the abuse themselves. Ultimately, the allegations of sexual assault and harassment on Twitter highlight the ongoing problem of sexual violence and abuse in our society. I know I said society. Any comments on that? You're getting shot. And the need for greater accountability and action to address these issues. While social media platforms like Twitter can be incredibly powerful tools for amplifying the voices of survivors and holding abusers accountable, they can also perpetuate 
a culture of abuse and harassment if they're not properly relegated and monitored. It's up to all of us to work together to make a safer, more just world for everyone. In all, Twitter can be a toxic platform for a number of reasons. Firstly, the platform is fast-paced. Real-time nature can lead to a culture of rapid-fire reactions and hot takes. Trust me, I've seen it. This is where users are encouraged to quickly weigh in on a topic or in a news event without taking time to fully consider their thoughts and feelings on the matter and come to a more concise opinion. The culture of instant gratification can also lead to a lack of nuance and empathy, with users often quick to judge and attack others without fully understanding their perspectives or experiences. Additionally, the platform's anonymity and lack of accountability can create an environment where harassment and abuse thrives. Trolls and bots can easily create multiple fake accounts to harass and target individuals, and Twitter's reporting mechanism and enforcement of its rules can often be slow or just straight up ineffective. Moreover, the platform's algorithms can create an echo chamber, where users are often exposed to viewpoints and opinions that align with their own, leading to the spread of misinformation and the reinforcement of existing biases. Again, Jordan B. Peterson. Overall, while Twitter can be a powerful tool for sharing information and connecting with others, its toxic culture can make it challenging and sometimes a harmful environment for users. Now that we have an understanding of both cancel culture and the allegations which can cause it, along with the kind of shitty behaviour Twitter's actually been up to that I didn't know about before starting this, let's have a look at a set of allegations. Now, we are on to the part of the video which could really get the Shadow Square Gang into a lot of trouble. So much so that both my script editor Dogs Dogs and a Fiverr lawyer have read over this script. So, whilst discussing each situation, we're going to follow three rules. The first rule being, no personal opinions will be given apart from one situation at the very end. Number two, each set of allegations will be kept semi-brief. And three, we ain't acting as judge, jury and executioner. I will only be outlining the allegations to identify a pattern of misconduct allegations and how this relates to Twitter, whether true or not. And each case relates to Twitter and shows us both sides of the coin. True allegations as well as allegations created either out of a smaller situation or a complete fabrication. And before we get into these, I need to state that this is not a call to arms. I don't want to see none of you fucking keyboard warriors out there going around, cancelling people, and causing a ruckus because you've watched this video and thought Shadow Square is telling me to kill. Don't do that. This video is a lot bigger than that. So let's start with Slazo. I, I think my reaction is kind of understandable when this whole thing rears its ugly head in a possibly career-changing way. I, I feel like that's an understandable reaction. And now Che's main reasoning for making all this public was that she's concerned that I'll do the same thing to other girls and that she's heard c concerning things about me with other people. In 2018, Australian YouTuber Michael Slazo... Slatecki? Again, I'm sorry Michael, I don't know how to say names. ...was accused of emotional and sexual abuse by a former girlfriend named Che. Che posted a lengthy video on YouTube detailing her accusations, which includes claims that Slazo had pressured her into sex, belittled her and gaslit her, and engaged in emotional abusive behaviour throughout their relationship. The allegations sparked a significant backlash against Slazo, which many of his fans and fellow YouTubers distancing himself or calling his channel to be removed. Slazo initially denied the allegations, but later issued an apology, which he acknowledged some of the behaviour had described had occurred, not to the extent that was released, as we found out later that some of the allegations were less than reputable. Following the allegations, YouTube launched an investigation into Slazo's channel and supposedly, according to this source, take up the pinch of salt, removed a couple of his videos for violating the platform's community guidelines. Slazo during this time could have potentially been demonetized. I haven't had enough time to look into this, but I'll pop it on screen now every has or hasn't. In the aftermath of these allegations, there was a significant debate within the YouTube community about appropriate ways to respond to allegations of abuse and harassment. 
Some argue that the community should take a believe a woman approach, where others express concerns about the potential false allegations and the need for due process. The Slazo allegations highlighted the need for greater awareness and understanding of the issues relating to consent and abuse in a relationship, as well as the importance of holding those who engage in abusive behaviour accountable for their actions on both sides of the aisle. The incident also raised the question about the role of social media platforms in re regulating and responding to allegations of abuse and harassment. The potential consequences for creators who are accused of engaging in such behaviour. I'm going to use this video to address the allegations made against me. Recently, to those who are unaware, I've been accused of grooming a 15-year-old boy when I was 19. That I'm some kind of predator and was aware of his age all along. This is categorically untrue and a complete lie. In 2020, British YouTuber Pyrocynical, real name Niall, I don't know whether that's his real last name, found it online, was accused of grooming a 15-year-old fan when he was 19. The allegations were made by someone on Twitter called Ivory, who claimed Pyrocynical had sent him sexually explicit messages, engaged in sexual roleplay, and also sent... Well, you know... It's a kink, okay? People are into it, like, getting big and for some reason passing wind. I don't know. I don't judge. Do whatever. After a small amount of time, Pyrocynical released a very long and in-depth video explaining the allegations, and to a large degree dispelling them. He apologised for his role in the allegations. However, they were dispelled. The Pyrocynical situation sparked a debate within the YouTube and Twitter community about the appropriate way to respond to allegations of grooming and sexual misconduct, as well as the importance of holding everyone accountable for actions taken. Some argue Pyrocynical's behaviour constituted the form of child grooming and sexual exploitation, whilst others expressed concern about the potential consequences of false allegations and the need for due process. The Pyrocynical allegations highlighted the importance of promoting a safe and respectful environment for fans and creators alike, and the need for greater awareness of understanding of issues related to consent and exploitation in relationships. The incident also raised the question about the responsibility of social media platforms to regulate and respond to allegations of abuse and harassment, and the potential consequences for the creators and the accusers who engage in the behaviour. So, again, so what brings you out here today? Um, well, I was uh, coming out here to... Glasses off. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I was actually coming out here to pick up a cupcake <laughs> and then go back home. Um... In 2021, popular YouTuber and Eagles fan EDP445, real name Bryant, was accused of engaging in sexually explicit conversations with minors. The allegations were initially made public by a group of YouTubers who set up a sting operation to catch EDP in the act. The group claimed they had posed as a 13-year-old girl and communicated with Morland on several occasions during which he sent sexually explicit messages and images. The allegations resulted in many of his fans and fellow YouTubers condemning his behaviour, calling for him to be held accountable for his actions. Morland initially denied the accusations, citing the meetup was for cupcake-related reasons. However, it was easily disproven. Following the allegations, several companies and organisations cut ties with Morland, including the Philadelphia Eagles, who revoked his season ticket and the YouTube network he was affiliated with. In addition to this, Morland was arrested by law enforcement for his alleged involvement in sexual conversations with minors. The EDP-445 allegations highlighted the need for greater awareness and understanding of the issues related to online grooming and exploitation of minors, as well as the importance of holding individuals who engage in such behaviour accountable for their actions. The incident also raised questions about the responsibility of social media platforms to regulate and respond to allegations of abuse and harassment and the potential consequences for creators who engage in such behaviour. Just a side note, if I sound any worse than I did like four minutes ago, it's because this is a different day and I have a cold. So like and subscribe to make me feel better because I'm dying! The first thing that I wanted to talk about with these allegations is I've never physically met them before, nor have I physically abused anybody across the board. In 2020, popular YouTuber and gamer Minilad, real name Craig Thompson, was accused of soliciting sexually explicit images from underage fans. The allegations were made public 
by a Twitter user named Shay, who claimed that Thompson had engaged in inappropriate behaviour with her when she was 16 years old. Following the allegations, several other individuals came forward with similar stories, alleging that Thompson had solicited explicit images from them when they were minors. In response to the allegations, Thompson issued a public apology in which he acknowledged his behaviour and expressed regret for his actions. If you couldn't sense the sarcasm there, you're an idiot. The allegations against Minnie Lad sparked significant debate within the YouTube community about the appropriate way to respond to allegations of grooming and sexual misconduct. You know, instead of a five minute video and then waiting a couple of months trying to pretend it never happened and then putting up a bigger video. You know, that. Thompson's YouTube channel was demonetized and he stepped back from public appearances. He occasionally live streams now from what I know. The incident led to a larger conversation within the YouTube community about the need of greater awareness and understanding of issues related to consent and exploitation in relationships, as well as the importance of creating a space that is safe for fans and creators alike. It also made some brilliant jokes for Nogla Terrorizer and the Vanos gang to make, so cheers for that. This man is a cunt. I checked with a lawyer friend. I can say this, and we will not get sued. We've been through a lot. We've been through a lot today. Yeah, today we got really far. Yeah. I'm just happy everyone got to see me. What the f Mini Lad is a cunt. Now that we've looked at the examples, we can go in depth about the mentality of the people who see the allegations. It can be broken down into three camps. Number one, believe the victim. Number two, innocent until proven guilty. Number three, Switzerland. Or on the fence until the full story can be perceived. I'm gonna get fucked for that joke. Let's start with believing the victim. The concept of believing the victim, above all else, refers to the principle that when someone come forward with allegations, being the victim of crime or abuse, that their account should be accepted as true unless there is significant evidence to suggest otherwise. Usually, in our situation, it can be best described as believing the allegations outright, with deviations from believing these allegations being treated with harsh treatment and harassment. The principle is particularly relevant in cases of sexual assault, domestic violence, and other forms of interpersonal violence, such as ones we've seen in this video, where victims are often reluctant to come forward due to fear of not being believed, shame, or other reasons. By believing the victim, it can create an environment where they feel safe to speak out and seek justice, and it also sends a message that such behaviour is not tolerated. However, it can be important to note that believing the victim does not mean that you should follow along blindly, accepting their account without questions. It means take the allegations seriously, conducting a fair and thorough investigation, and providing support and resources to the victim. It also means being aware of the potential for false allegations and taking steps to protect the rights of those accused. The goal is to strike a balance between supporting the victim and ensuring due process for all parties involved. The line is a hard one to follow, and it can often lead to a mob mentality, either for better or for worse. The best case scenario here would be the allegations be true and the victim is able to seek justice. On the other hand, the worst case scenario would be the victim having fabricated evidence, leading to unfair harassment and abuse against the individual who does not deserve it. Take the recent quiet situation, where allegations were brought up to him, and the backlash in quite being labelled a rapist and abuser, only for it to be disproven by the man himself, leaving a permanent and completely unnecessary mark on his life, something that can destroy a person. Moving on to the concept of innocence until proven guilty. This concept is a fundamental principle of the legal system in many countries. It means that a person accused of crime is presumed to be innocent until they are proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law, or in our case, the media machine. This principle serves as a safeguard against unjust convictions and wrongful imprisonment. It places the burden of proof on the prosecution to prove their case against the accused, rather than the accused having to prove their innocence. Under this principle, the accused has right to fair trial, right to legal representation, the right to present evidence and witnesses in their defence, and the right to confront their accusers. It also means the prosecution must present significant evidence to convince a judge or jury the accused guilt and the accused cannot be convicted on the bias of suspicion, rumours or hearsay. Innocent until proven guilty is a cornerstone of the justice system and it is designed to protect the rights and freedoms of all individuals regardless of their social status, background or the nature of the crime they are accused of committing. Twitter may have policies that prohibit the use of making false and defamatory statements about others or from engaging in harassment or threats. 
Twitter may also have processes for reporting and investigating violations of its policy and for removing or restricting content that violates that policy. In general, it's likely that Twitter would respect the concept of innocence until proven guilty and encourage users to do the same. This may include reminding users that accusing accusations of wrongdoing do not automatically make someone guilty and that all individuals have a right to due process and a fair trial. That was my hand. Ow. Anyone else hear that click? I did it again. However, given the fast pace and often contentious nature of the media machine, it's possible that some users just ignore this and even actively oppose the concept of innocence until proven guilty in their online interaction. In some cases, Twitter may take steps to enforce its policies and protect the rights of all users on its platform. Finally, let's look at those who identify as Switzerland. Or sit on the fence. I need to stop making that joke. I'm going to get into trouble. To sit on the fence means to remain neutral or undecided on an issue, or avoid taking a clear position or making a decision. It's often used to describe individuals who are hesitant or reluctant to choose a side or debate in an argument, or who choose to remain uninvolved in a particular issue. In context of Twitter, where opinions and viewpoints are often expressed in a concise and public manner, sitting on the fence may be seen as a way to avoid conflict or controversy, or as an attempt to remain neutral or objective in stance. However, it can also be perceived as a lack of engagement or commitment to a particular cause or issue. Pros of sitting on the fence. Neutral stance. Sitting on the fence allows individuals to maintain a neutral stance on a controversial issue, avoiding the risk of offending or alienating others who may differ in opinion. Open-mindedness. Sitting on the fence can be a sign of open-mindedness, apparently, as it indicates the willingness to consider different perspectives and not jump to conclusions too quickly. And avoiding hasty decisions. I guess this is pretty much self-explanatory. You know, quite situation. Again. The cons of sitting on the fence are lack of conviction. Sitting on the fence can be seen as lack of conviction or lack of commitment to a particular cause or issue, and it may lead to the perception of weakness or indecisiveness, apparently. Ineffectiveness. Failing to take a clear stance on an issue can make it difficult to effect change or achieve a specific goal. And finally, missed opportunities. By remaining neutral and undecided, individuals may miss the opportunities to take action or make a difference on important issues that affect their lives and the lives of others. Overall, sitting on the fence have both advantages and disadvantages, and the decision to do so should be made on an individual circumstance. The nature of the issue, the personal values and the beliefs should all be taken into account when sitting on the fence. I can't breathe, I have AIDS. I have been baptized twice, once in water, once in flame. I will carry the fire of the Holy Spirit inside until I stand before my Lord for judgment. The consequences for a victim of fake sexual assault allegations can be severe and long-lasting. They can include such things like damage to reputation, emotional distress, legal fees in some cases, loss of employment and opportunities, and even as far as physical harm. Which is the scary bit. Off script for a second. I would be genuinely terrified if someone fabricated allegations of certain natures such as this against me. Firstly, because I'd be mortified that anyone could even conceive of me doing such a thing. I don't, don't want people to think that of me. I would never, ever do something so vile. And secondly, it... it it's a permanent mark on your life. You can never escape that shit. Never. Again, if I sound like shit, I apologise. I'm still ill. This is recorded on a separate day when I thought I might feel better, but it turns out I don't. It's important to note that fake sexual assault allocations are relatively rare. The vast majority of sexual assault survivors are telling the truth. However, when false allegations occur, they have serious consequences for the victim, and it is important to take them seriously and ensure that they are properly investigated and addressed. Fake sexual assault allegations have a negative impact on truthful allegations in several ways. It can undermine the credibility of true 
allegations, making it harder to believe. It can divert attention from real sexual assault allegations because someone is vying for attention they do not deserve. It can reinforce the harmful stereotypes that some people perceive of women, Andrew Tate being a prime example, and Sneeko, fuck you Sneeko. And it can also distract from real issues. It's a genuine scary thing, and it's a hard line to walk. Now, you may have noticed something different throughout this video. It, it lacks the usual banter and opinion we partake in on this channel. Fear not, we are about to delve into my personal opinions on the truth, as well as the false allegations. However, I have to explain why I'm being so fucking neutral and information-based. When writing an essay on sexual exploitation and assault, it's important to remain as neutral and objective as possible in order to provide a fair and balanced analysis on the topic. This means that avoiding personal biases and opinions and presenting information and evidence in an unbiased, objective manner. One of the main reasons for this is to ensure all parties involved treat fairly and justly. Real and fake allegations can have a significant consequence for both the accuser and the accused, and it is important to take the approach on the topic with sensitivity and empathy toward both sides. Taking a neutral stance allows us to consider both perspectives without favouring one over the other. Additionally, remaining neutral helps promote a culture of respect and understanding around the issue of sexual assault. By avoiding biases and preconceived notions, we can focus on the facts and evidence surrounding each case and promote a constructive dialogue around the issue. Furthermore, remaining neutral allows us to better understand the complexities of sexual assault and the challenges both real survivors and those falsely accused face. By taking a neutral approach, we can examine the legal and social implications of each case and consider the best way to address and prevent sexual assault in the future. In conclusion, it's essential to remain neutral when writing about sexual assault allegations, both real and fake. This approach ensures all parties are treated fairly and justly, promotes a culture of respect and understanding, and allows us to understand the complexities of sexual assault and the challenges that both real and falsely accused face. Now we have that out of the way, I can legally talk about my own opinions without worrying, under the understanding that we're not after a witch hunt, there's no witch hunt required here, and there is no harassment being required here, I swear to god. See any of you do that, I'm gonna fucking flip my shit, because I've just had to read out a full paragraph of legal jargon, and now I'm gonna say my opinion, and if my opinion is taken out of context, I'm going to kill. There's a feeling I get. Whenever I catch wind on a new controversy around the YouTube in this vein, I feel dread. Just pure, unadulterated dread. It's like that feeling you get when you get sacked from your job because you called a customer a cunt just a little too loudly, which resulted in a shitstorm from your line manager, and then you called him bold, which only kind of made things worse. And you can tell it's been frustrating holding back my writing to a legal degree. I think the best way to describe this feeling is this, to discuss the Mini Lad situation. I haven't exactly kept it a secret that I openly hate Mini Lad. The allegations which turned out to be true horrified me, because as a kid, Mini was one of the people I watched religiously. I enjoyed every fucking video he put out. As I got older, I did begin to drift, but I would still come back to watch his new content whenever it came out. The first thing that put me off is when the whole Mini Lad and Terrorizer drama happened. When the full allegations came out, I was horrified. Then, I got angry. Like, I created a fucking mini-series called Scum Dumpster on the channel to vent and rag on him for two reasons. One, I completely and utterly despise the actions he took. And two, I felt a degree of betrayal. Yeah, I get it, I get it. Sounds kind of bizarre. But let me explain. Mini Lad was a creator I looked up to. Finding out he was fucking sexting under underage girls was absolutely fucking disgusting. It also made me feel disgusting by association, because I supported him for one hell of a long time, and to find out I was supporting a paedophile was both shocking and kind of sickening. Then finding out he openly used both the n-word and the f-slur back in the day made things kind of worse. As I stated a million and one times on this channel, I am gay. And I also cannot stand hate. It's not fair to a signaling either. I openly experience hate in my life, whether from bullies in school or assholes in the workplace. I've seen enough of it in my life to be thoroughly opposed to it. So, 
to find this out made me even angrier. Angry enough again to make multiple videos ranting about it, which, looking back, were bad ideas. I had not scripted the large majority of those videos, bar one, because I was an angry bastard. Nowadays, I tend to keep my opinions to myself to a degree. Mainly due to the fact that I don't enjoy being angry, shock and surprise, I know. However, I also don't believe it's always my place to weigh in on topics like this. I make stupid YouTube videos as a hobby, I work as a waiter, I have no merit or right to delve into such topics on live with a brush of my fingers just to please the media machine. I'd be a fool to do so. However, there are fools out there who delve into these topics with no reason other than to support rage or some sick individual who does it for kicks. Again, this ain't to say everyone who puts out allegations is in the right in telling the truth. Look at the recent Quiet situation, where allegations were put out by the individual known as Orion, turned out to be fabricated, and Quiet had to reveal his face and relive a painful time in his life just to defend himself. The situation is fucked. I've been advised not to go in too in-depth on any of the situations as it ain't my place, and it would also open me up to defamation if any party ever wanted to stop people discussing them and decided we would be a good target, which, you know, fucking sucks. Because I would love to sit here and babble on about my full opinions on each and every topic that we've discussed, each person. I'd love that. And I know people do that. There are hundreds of YouTubers that rag on EDP, but I don't feel comfortable doing so. Not because I support him, because Jesus Christ, I don't think anyone supports him anymore, but because I do not want to risk it. Because at any point, any one of the people we talked about who have been proven to be guilty could decide that they don't want people talking about it anymore because it's not been through a court of law. They could happily go for defamation, which is scary, but hey ho. What are you going to do? It's better to be safe than it is to be sorry. <sighs> I've been sitting on this idea for quite a while. Because there's no satisfying way to conclude. I've sat for a while trying to possibly find a way to end this video right. And there isn't exactly a way to do that. I'm no expert on this subject. I'm a scientist first, a writer second, and a gay man last. I have no way to offer a good solution to this problem. It fucking hurts. All I can do is give a bit of advice. One, take into account all sides before rushing in. Number two, take into account the full reality and seriousness of allegations. Number three, realize that no one's perfect and people do lie. And the last one, this is important. Always tell Mini Lad slash Craig Thompson to fuck off. Be kind to each other. Eat your greens. Like and subscribe if you think you want to do that. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye. So, I'm officially back, it's been a while. I'm so tired. So, I'm officially back. It's been a while. I had a video scheduled for release, but things happened. I'm not gonna break character fully and go into detail about what happened, but I'll give you an overview. Since the QA video came out, I've been in a transitional phase in my life, which means bugger all has been constant for me. And now I have an adorable baby niece, who I love dearly, and I also lost someone I was incredibly close to. All of which combined with a mixture of changing environments in my life and losing university for the third time meant I needed to take a step back from the internet. You may have noticed I appeared a couple of times on Anand's stream and streamed a handful of times myself on Twitch. However, it didn't really help. So I did what I always do to get my head straight. I sat down and worked. I worked on this video. I researched this in the background whenever I felt down or directionless. And this was the final product. I hope it's pleasing, if not slightly depressing return to the square. I do have more videos lined up, and as well as the elusive Fallout New Vegas video, it's in the works, it's going to take a very long time to do because I've got to travel around a couple of places to get some IRL footage, don't worry you're not seeing my face, but I'll keep you updated on that. Anyway, I hope you're all well. It's nice to be back and I'll see you soon, probably in May or June, 
for the next video on my list. <sighs> I hope you're all well. See you soon. Stay safe. Watch the roads and for Lord's sakes be nice in the comments or I will turn this car around and we'll all go over. I bloody made it!